everyone, I'm Jessica Stutzman and welcome back to the Mill Creek Government Channel. Founded in 1913, the Erie Philharmonic is one of the oldest orchestras in America. The mission of the Erie Philharmonic is to strengthen our community and region by providing high quality live orchestra concerts and programs that enrich, entertain, and educate people of all ages. With world-class musicians and distinguished guest artists, the 2019 season is filled with something for everyone. Joining me today to discuss the highlights of the Erie Philharmonic is Executive Director Steve Weiser. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, always a pleasure to be here. Well, I think you have so many exciting, like you said, concerts, events. Um, I really, I'm just, I'm really looking forward to what you guys have going this season. What I want to do and what I want to share with our audience right now, okay. um, without being at the Warner Theater, right. um, help our audience meet the orchestra. So I think that the best way to describe it is there are 60 to 90 musicians on stage for any concerts that you're going to come see. If it's a big Mahler symphony where there's a big chorus and musicians, you might get up to 200 people on stage. And then for a normal smaller concert of say Beethoven, you have right around like 50 or 60 people. And we're sort of made up of, of different, the, the, the families that you learn about when you're in kindergarten and first or second grade, that, that's sort of the livelihood of what the orchestra is. You have your string families across the front of the stage, your wind players, your brass players, and your percussion players. So within that, you have flutes, oboes, clarinets, bassoons, trumpets, French horns, trombones, all the percussion instruments, and then your different sized violin, viola, cello, and bass. And within each of those are sort of members of our family now that we've really gotten to know over the past couple years between me going into my fifth season as executive director and playing with the orchestra for three years before that some of those musicians have become family friends that you know forever so but between some of the violinists that have been in the orchestra since the 70s they've really seen a lot of the change that's gone on both in the orchestra but both in Erie so I think they they have to love I think the new direction that everything has taken is just getting to be a part of it from the ground level up and and does everybody have um, uh, a background that um, is um, I don't want to say the same, but how does everybody get their background in the music before they right. come to the Erie Philharmonic? So a lot of them, it's sort of a mix of two. Um, right now, some of the players that have been in the orchestra a little bit longer are uh, will be professors at local universities. So between Fredonia, Edinburgh, Mercyhurst, uh, down to Allegheny, up to Fredonia, and even up in Rochester and Buffalo, our musicians will be music professors up there. So during the day, they're teaching uh, private lessons, leading orchestra rehearsals, and then in the evenings, they'll come down and rehearse for us. Um, some of the other musicians are local teachers. Some of them work at banks or retirement communities. So it's sort of a mix that some people do it for their living and some people this is a passion that they've been able to keep up through all of their lives. And for us, the rehearsal schedules are, are pretty simple, that if we have a concert on a Saturday night, we don't rehearse much longer than just the week ahead of time. So if you're a musician with the Erie Phil, you're given your music about a month before the concert, and you're expected to show up at the first rehearsal ready to go. And then for, for a Pops concert, so if we do like our Aretha Franklin show for next year, we get one rehearsal. So you have to show up, you have one two and a half hour rehearsal, and then you take a break and you do the concert that night. Some of our bigger concerts, you maybe have four rehearsals that will rehearse Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and then do the concert Saturday night. But n for no concert do we rehearse more than four times. That's for, a lot of pressure. It is, and that's, and that's sort of why it, it's why it's, it's, I think it's such a competitive and such an amazing field and it's why the concerts are so amazing is you're getting these local musicians and regional musicians at the top of their game. Mm -hmm. That when you show up, it, it's not time to practice and learn your music, it's time to work with our music director and work with the musicians to make this concert so special. It's like, it's like a football team, it's like any sport coming together. You, all the practice is done ahead of time and when you show up and play a game, you're not learning how to run a pass route mm -hmm. or learning how to hit a baseball. That work's been done years leading up to those concerts. What a good analogy. I really Definitely. like that. I like sports too, so that's <laughs> easy. <laughs> the Erie Philharmonic has seen a lot of change for an organization that has been around for over a hundred years. So what do some of those changes mean and what are we seeing for the future? I think that the neatest thing that we've seen is for a group that is over a hundred years old, the one thing that we really wanted to work on is almost sort of a, a so what, like yes, we're old, 
what are we gonna do next? And that was one thing that we really started to focus when we started as a new staff, which is one of the things that really helped all of our changes is that everybody started new when I started about four years ago. So everybody had to learn how to redo everything from scratch. And that almost helped a little bit because we had to redo marketing, branding, logo, fonts, all of the simple business decisions we were able to craft, almost this new story. And that fed right into us having to change office buildings. My first day on the job, I, we were told that we had to move offices. So nothing will get you thinking about the future than having to move yeah. right away. So we found our new office home at the Miser Building, which is downtown on 10th Street. It was nice to get right in the heart of the city. And then short after that, we learned that the Warner renovations were finally, knock on wood, were finally going to happen. So even then, we started now really shifting our schedule. So we know in a year, the renovations are going to happen to the theater, but it's already changing our current concert schedule. So it's making us plan ahead and what pieces we can play, what's it going to look like when we have a new home. So it's, it definitely, it forces us to exist on multiple timelines. And, and when you do make a move, you know, and you're, and you're uh, boxing all of your your stuff, so to say, right. you know, you're dis you're deciding on what you want to keep and what you want to leave behind. I'm exactly. sure that that really played a lot into it. It was one of the neatest things. Again, half of the the cool archive stories that we've discovered over the past couple years came out of us having to move because we had to go through shelves and boxes that probably hadn't been touched in decades. Once they were organized and cataloged, they were shut, and that was it. So that was where so many of the historical things where we found a, uh, a Voice of America broadcast from 1950, we found an, an NBC radio broadcast where they came to Erie and recorded the Erie Phil live. <clears throat> we found all of those things because we had to move and because somebody had to clear out the dusty boxes and go through, I'm also a nerd, so I, I love doing that, mm -hmm. but having to go through folder by folder by folder and you find this picture and then you do the research, oh, who is that person? And then you go back in time to learn all the fabulous things about the history that <clears throat> I think everybody in Erie knew but just sort of forgot. And I think that's been one of the neatest things is bringing some of that stuff back to the forefront. That, like, to, to have a conductor like we had in the, in the mid 40s and early 50s, uh, his name was Fritz Mahler, but his, his like, first cousin once removed was the famous composer Gustav Mahler. So to have someone at that level just be in Erie for that long period of time, it's, it's a lot of fun things that we discovered. But you're right, it's because it's because we had to pack up and go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I do <coughs> love those old photos, too. I think yeah. they so tell such a good story. Definitely. Um, and maybe because of the move or maybe because of other reasons, how have you grown community presence outside of, outside of the Warner Theater now? Right, and I, as, you, as you said early on in, in the program today, our mission statement, and as any mission statement, there's always two to three sentences of a lot of gobbledygook, but within the mission statement are the three words, enrich, entertain, and educate. And all we wanted to do was just simplify the mission to focus on these, those three things. So we do the entertain thing pretty well, with the concerts and what we do at the Warner Theater. The educate thing, we definitely increased with our youth concerts and finding ways to get more students to come to them. But we really wanted to hit on the enrich aspect, that if, if there's this word in our mission statement, what, what are we doing about it? And that was where we started to create programs out of the Warner, doing the free summer concerts that we do at the Art Museum and at LEAF at Lake Erie Arboretum, and then creating the Bruce Morton Wright Chamber Series that we started last year, where we now get to do four to six free concerts every year in venues outside of the Warner. So maybe, and even if you make a concert at the Warner Theater free, there can still sometimes be an intimidation factor that maybe people don't feel comfortable coming to the Warner Theater, even if we'd make the, the concert free. But if we do a really nice concert in any local church anywhere across the city, we are literally saying this concert is for everybody. The doors are open, please come in and check us out. You, you'll really be surprised by what you hear. And that, that's really been fun this past year is watching that Chamber series grow. We probably saw an extra two or 3,000 people just from that series this year. And it lets us showcase the musicians in a way that we could never do a small concert on the stage at the Warner because the Warner Theater is so big. But in one of these little churches, we can put together a, a mix of eight to 12 musicians. And it's your first time in your life to probably see those musicians in that small of a group together. Mm -hmm. So it's been a lot of fun. Between that, we've really upped our piano donation program. Since this past fall of October of last year, we've donated 34 pianos directly into family houses wow. that could not necessarily afford a real instrument. And how does somebody go about 
getting a piano donated to their home. So we have a website, eriefill.org slash piano. It's as easy as you get. And if you have a piano that you would like to donate to the program, it can go through that website. And if you're a young student who's requesting a piano, you can also go to that website as well. And it really works out well. We have one piano mover that probably loves and hates me on any given day, depending on where the piano goes. And we always have to make sure that the piano fits. We can't take all pianos, and we normally ask that the pianos are sponsored just because we, we pass on the cost directly to the mover. Mm -hmm. And uh, we pretty much, we, we get the, we'll get it in, we'll get a couple pictures of the piano, we'll find a couple donation places for it and, and make it happen. But we've had some really fabulous, I mean, nothing warms your heart than when uh, the piano is waiting for a kid when they come home from school and there's just a piano sitting in their living room that they didn't know was going to be there. I feel like I can just <clears throat> picture the big red bow on top when we, they get home. We had it. There's If you go if you go on our website now, eerifo.org slash piano, we have a couple pictures in a row that show the story that a mom literally did that. Put a bow in the piano, brought the daughter in with her eyes like covered her eyes and then got her in front of the piano and then removed like basically removed the blindfold and we have the picture of like the girl almost tearing up in front of the piano it's it, it's really feel good stuff because we we know we do concerts we know we sell out events and things go well but it's that one moment in time like that that little piano student is never going to forget that feeling mm -hmm. and it's so nice that we had the smallest part in making that happen and so and and pianos are not um, inexpensive True. pieces, um, you know, musical instruments. And uh, I did have, I did used to play piano when I was younger and we had a baby grand piano. What does the average piano cost? So, I mean, if you want to find a good used piano on Craigslist, you're looking anywhere, like you won't find anything south of $2,000 mm -hmm. easily. Mm -hmm. And new pianos, only because we've we've had to do research, like a, a new baby grand is $160,000. Wow. So between $2,000 and $160,000, mm -hmm. everywhere in the middle mm -hmm. can really be an, an, an existing point for pianos. But that's, that's the thing, is a lot of times there are ones that are easy to find because you have people that are moving into a retirement community or a loved one passed away and right. you're, you're stuck up against a wall that you don't have anything to do with this piano, I'd say 75% of the time we're able to help. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we'll get the phone call like I need the piano moved tomorrow. Can't always make those happen. Yeah. But as long as we have enough lead time and a good place to take it and it's a, a worthy piano to give to another family, we can normally make it happen. And I'm sure those who are donating the piano just want it to make music again. Definitely. And th that's always the story we'll tell is we always try our best. With, with a staff of six, I wish we could do more. But we definitely try as hard as we can to send along the follow-up pictures of here's the family where your piano went. Mm -hmm. Here's the here's the kid playing with the piano. So that's why at least by having, we, we have a repository online with all of the pianos we've donated. Everybody can see the pictures there. So if you have donated your piano, that's definitely the place to go because you can definitely see the smiling face. We get a picture of every single donation we have at least one picture of. Mm -hmm. And fun. tell me a little bit more about the free concerts. You said, again, some are at the Erie Art Museum during right. their luncheons. Where are some of the other, one, other ones held throughout the year? So this, this past year, we went to some of the, the local churches that have we always need to find a place that has a stage big enough where you can fit an orchestra. So we love uh, First Presbyterian Church of the Covenant. It can sit right around seven to 800 people, and the, the stage area can fit right around 22. And for those who were at that concert this past year, we basically broke the church. We ran out of space, people had to sit on stage, and if anyone that's been to Church of the Covenant, there's a built-in choir loft behind the, the altar area. People had to sit in the choir loft, so there were there were a lot of people at that one. We do stuff at the Blasco Library in the Hurt Auditorium, which is a beautiful space, uh, the Cathedral of St. Paul. So all of this sort of, uh, we started this year in the core churches to be able to get music out of the Warner but still close. And then for this coming year, we're looking to go to the east side. We love to go to St. Luke's. So we're sort of gonna make a tour to that area. We love to get down to sort of the Edinburgh area uh, to do something at maybe at, uh, in Cole Auditorium at Edinburgh University and eventually get down to Allegheny and into the Oil City and Titusville areas. That's amazing, I love that. Um, I'm just moving along here, what is the virtual orchestra? So uh, I'll say it again, I am I'm not afraid to be a tech nerd. People know that I, I love my Apple things, I love, I love computers, I love video games, it's, it's, it's definitely a habit. 
One of the things I stumbled across a couple years ago at an orchestra conference was there's an orchestra in London called the Philharmonia. And the one thing you learn right away about European orchestras is they're all state funded, which means they can do an incredible amount of really cool stuff. And one of the things I saw this orchestra did is they turned a, muse they turned a piece of music into a museum exhibit. So they took the planets, which everybody knows, bits and pieces of, of Gustav Holst, the planets, they turned it into different museum exhibits different, in different rooms. So if you walked into one room, they put a really fancy GoPro camera on the edge of a trombone slide. So you could watch an entire piece of music like you were a little ant on the end of the trombone slide going up and down. You could go into a different room and interact with computerized drums. There was one where you could actually follow a, a moving ball on the screen and conduct along like a karaoke style game. And then one of the neatest things I had seen where they had created something where you can sit on stage like you're in the middle of the orchestra. So we wanted to find a way to do that. So with some local funding last year, um, with all local grant funding, we recorded the orchestra at the season finale last season using these four sort of globe cameras that had really high def cameras all around them in a circle. And it records out in like a fishbowl. And then we take all the files back, you mix the audio with it, and you put on these really, really cool virtual reality headsets, and it's like you were sitting at that exact moment in the middle of the concert. Wow. So when you put on the headset, you look up and you see our music director right in front of you. And as you look to your left, there's a cello here, and your violin section is here. You can see the concert master in front of you, the audience is out there. But as you turn around, all of your wind players are behind you. So it literally is like you're sitting in the middle of the stage. And it's interactive, so as you move, the camera the camera moves exactly, so okay. when you move your head down, you're looking at the floor of the Warner Theater, mm -hmm. or you look up and you can see the lights. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really fascinating, and it's, it's the kind of thing that you want it to be cool, because we created and we, we spent hours and, and weeks working on this. You want it to be neat. And you hope that when like, you, you take it to an elementary school, like we did to Grover Cleveland uh, about a month ago, you go to put it on the little kid's head, and you hope that they don't have the reaction of, oh, this is dumb. And every kid puts it on and is like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And you have these kids that have never, they've probably never seen a live orchestra before. They've had to learn about an orchestra by seeing a poster on the wall. And now they can learn about an orchestra by literally sitting in the middle of it. Did it make any of the students want to pick up an instrument and start playing? It, it definitely, it, it, it has to inspire them. We, we, we want to do a little more follow-up where we bring instruments they can actually play at that <laughs> moment in time. But so many of those kids, and that was why we picked third grade, because that's the year before they make a choice to go start playing an instrument. And it, it really was, it was a fascinating thing to see. And you can see the same concert from four different camera views. So we had one camera in front of the, in front of the music director, a couple different places across the stage, and then we had one right in front of the percussion section. So you can actually watch this whole piece and you can watch eight drummers play all the different instruments. It's, it's really fun. And I will say, again, you know, as somebody who's not musically inclined anymore, I still greatly appreciate the talent Right. of, again, your musicians, the Erie Philharmonic, and so I think being able to sit in there and, and I don't want to say pretend to be a part of, of that concert, but it makes you, you're right in the middle of it. It's the one comment that we've really received from a lot of the adults that have used it, is that they weren't aware that that's how powerful it sounds. Because you put on, we have really nice noise-canceling headphones, and when you put these headphones on and sit there, you're really surrounded by 90 human beings playing music, not necessarily as loud as they can, but it's loud. And that that's, you never get that feeling. When you're in the Warner, it's always a one-sided feeling that the sound's coming at you. But when you're in the middle of the stage, that's what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. That you're, from all sides, you're being surrounded by, again, this just incredible, full, powerful sound. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's something that I think, young and old, that's something you can really appreciate. And then the next time you're at a concert, you can sort of look on stage and be like, oh, that's where I was sitting in the VR thing. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're portable. That's the neatest thing is we have, we worked with a local business, White Thorn Digital, and they managed to make it be VR in a, in a suitcase. So I feel like James Bond, every time I show up at this thing, it's just this, this big briefcase. You pop on a thing open up the lid, there's only one cord that comes out of a hole in the side of the box. You plug it in, there's a computer buried in the box. Computer turns on, you flip up, there's a screen, you unfold your keyboard, and the VR unit is all in this one suitcase. So you can literally take it to 
uh, celebrate Erie, you can take it to where it beat Beethoven, you can really take it anywhere and just have VR on the go. And that's what I was going to ask, how our viewers can experience this. Is it in any one location, but you said it's mobile, so. It's definitely mobile, it's it's always at our office, but it's also anytime we have a concert in the Warner Theater, it is always set up in the lobby pre-concert. Oh, okay. And that sort of ends up being my new thing that I get to do. I'm either um, sort of greeting people when they come in, talking to our board members and other supporters that are there, and then I get to play with the VR with people. And it's by far the, the coolest thing. And we've had a ton of people, again, old and young people have tried this and everybody likes it. That's mm -hmm. the neatest thing. So any concert at the Warner, it's available. Anytime we do anything over the summer, we'll have it there for our Beat Beethoven big 5K street fair that's moving locations this year, but that We'll also have it there. So anytime we're doing something, you you can take a bet it'll be there. Okay, I'm gonna try it the next time I'm at the it's Warner. It's fun. You gotta. <laughs> and and for your social media presence, you mm -hmm. guys you do have a great presence on the internet. Um, tell me a little bit about your social media accounts. So the one thing when we all started as a new staff is we acknowledged that we had to yes use social media. So it's good when we started. We noticed that it was almost a little bit of low-hanging fruit, that it hadn't been utilized as much as it could. And right when we started about four years ago was when the ability to boost posts and advertising really kind of kicked up. So we definitely invested more in advertising and using things within our Facebook page. And with the ability to track using Google Pixels and see what happens, we can really see how many ticket sales specifically come from Facebook posts. Mm -hmm. But the thing that we really try to do now is we want to tell stories with how, or with what, especially with what our Facebook page does. So I'll sort of schedule those posts on a Monday. I'll schedule the entire week's worth of posts, looking at what story do we want to tell this week. Because we don't just want to talk about the concerts we're selling tickets for. We want to put up a funny YouTube video. We want to find if we're doing, a, we just had a really successful Queen concert, and leading into that, we found a, a, there's a really funny video of a squirrel that someone lined up to sound like Freddie Mercury. That's funny. So n not being afraid to never take ourselves too seriously, mm -hmm. which I think has really been important for us. So finding a way to mix and match, being informative, being fun, being able to put up a picture of what well, we just did a petting zoo this morning at a local elementary school. Here's a picture of three kids that have never played a violin before in their lives. So it's finding the finding the why of what we do and putting it on display 24/7, almost like a news feed mm -hmm. for us. And then we branched out, and then we uh, we started an Instagram and a Twitter account that we actually split up between different staff members. Because I initially I started doing all of the pages, and it ends. It, it's tricky when you have one person telling the same story through three different accounts. So we split it up between two other staff members. One of them took over the Instagram, and one of them took over the Twitter. And instantly, those two accounts exploded because you had a different voice. You had a different approach, someone different telling their own story within what the Phil is doing, approaching it that way. And then for us, YouTube is vital as sort of the, again, the repository for all of our videos. We make all of our TV commercials in-house, all of our own promo spots, all of our own videos that show the outreach that we do. So they need a place to live and be displayed. And you mentioned Queen, mm -hmm. um, the Queen concert that you did. Let's talk about what the rest of the season holds. Got it. So next season is definitely one one for the record books. We're, we're really excited. We know that, knock on wood again, this is the final season before Warner Theater renovations. So we really wanted to go out with a bang. And it's also the end of our Beethoven 4 before festival. Is Beethoven's 250th birthday is in 2020. So anytime a composer has a birthday, and it's always an excuse for us to do something cool with it. So we wanted to end the season with Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which is Ode to Joy. You either know it or you recognize it. Everybody knows what that piece of music is. So that, we sort of worked backwards from this season. We knew we needed to end everything with that. So that's April 4th of next year, is Beethoven Ninth. And then jumping up to start the season, uh, a few years ago, we started doing movie concerts. So the first year we did a movie show, we did Casablanca. That was my favorite. Yep, which is a lot I of fun. I loved it. And that one sold out a month ahead of time. So th the next time that we did it, we switched on to do Bugs Bunny. And then this past year, we did Wizard of Oz. So Bugs Bunny wanted to come back with a world premiere, which we couldn't pass up. So it's a whole new collection of cartoons. We have Aretha Franklin, our normal Holiday Pops concert, an evening of Rodgers and Hammerstein, which everybody loves. And then on the symphonic side, Shostakovich V, Pines of Rome, Beethoven, and uh, a Grammy winner, uh, Edgar Meyer. Is, if Yo-Yo Ma needs a bass player, Edgar Meyer is his bass player. So Grammy winners, y you name it. 
Steve, I just, I can't even believe this. Our show is actually coming to an end and I could sit here and talk to you for That's another half an hour. <laughs> so what I want to do is really direct our viewers. How do we, how do we check out where are these events? How do we buy tickets? Okay. Um, I just really want people to attend uh, the concerts because they are phenomenal. So the simplest way is eeriefill.org is the simplest way that sort of it's an active website it's updated all the time if you find the fill on Facebook that's also a great way to be able to do it and we have a new app that is available on iPhone and Android so if you search for the Erie fill on the App Store you'll find us there as well wonderful Steve thank you so much for coming in you've talked about so many amazing programs that were brand new to me and and again I am really excited Casablanca was my favorite Definitely. so I'm really excited <laughs> to see everything again those movie concert series that Fun. you guys are talking about I'm really excited for this season for you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Viewers, what we didn't mention was that they do always need volunteers. So if you're, again, sitting in the audience and hearing everything that Steve has had to say and you are very passionate about it, please give their organization a call. Um, their events are really, really spectacular. You won't be disappointed. I want to thank you for tuning in to the Milk Creek Government Channel. And until next time, have a great day.